Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the acute inflammatory response and anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so we're getting to the end now of our discussion of the acute inflammatory response. So, we've discussed that type 2 activated cells, uh, endothelial cells specifically, at first they uh, express E-selectin and CXCL8, and this allows them to recruit more neutrophils uh, than just the type 1 activated endothelial cells were re uh, recruiting. Uh, however, after around 6 to 24 hours, what happens is the type 2 activation evolves, basically, and you stop expressing more E-selectin, and you start expressing more ICAM-1, Okay, so remember ICAM-1, or intercellular adhesion molecule 1, was already expressed constitutively on the surface of endothelial cells, but now we're going to upregulate its expression. We're also going to start expressing amongst another immunoglobulin superfamily cell adhesion molecule, known as VCAM-1, for vascular cell adhesion molecule 1, and then we're also going to start expressing another chemokine, which is the CCL2, which stands for the CC chemokine ligand 2. Now, this is going to help recruit a new type of white blood cell from the blood, so that the next type of white blood cell we're going to start recruiting are monocytes. Okay, so here is a monocyte here. Now, monocytes have a nor more normal nucleus than neutrophils. They have a single-lobed nucleus, or in fact, they don't really have a lobe structure at all. They just have a single spherical nucleus, okay? And uh, they are the precursors to macrophages, okay? So you do not have macrophages circulating within the blood. Uh, instead, you have these monocytes. And when monocytes leave the blood and go into the interstitial fluid, they will differentiate into macrophages. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to recruit monocytes to the site of inflammation then. So the process is very similar to the recruitment of neutrophils. Initially, the monocyte will roll along the surface of these endothelial cells. Now, in the case of neutrophils, we've seen that uh, when the uh, neutrophil was rolling along the surface of the endothelium, you had these bonds between E-selectin and, on, well, E-selectin on the surface of the endothelial cell and Silyl Lewis X on the uh, surface of the neutrophil, and those were continuously being formed and broken. Now, the exact same thing is going to happen for the monocyte. So the endothelial cells do still have their E-selectin, so they, remember they uh, at first, when you initially type 2 activated an endothelial cell, it started expressing E-selectin because of nuclear factor kappa B and uh, activator protein 1. And it's now stopped expressing E-selectin, e and it started uh, expressing ICAM1, VCAM1, and CCL2 instead. However, you will still have the E-selectin that you made previously on the endothelial cells. It's not as though it suddenly all vanishes. Okay, and monocytes too, like neutrophils, do have Cyanyl Lewis X on their surface. Okay, so remember Cyanyl Lewis X is actually a tiny little molecule. It's a small carbohydrate molecule that will be attached to uh, proteins on the surface of the monocyte. Okay, and the abbreviation for Cyanyl Lewis X, by the way, is S for Cyanyl, L-E for Lewis, and then you put an X up here for the X. Okay, so this is E-selectin. Uh, here in red, and that is Cyanyl Lewis X in turquoise. So what's going to happen is these interactions between Cyanyl Lewis X and E-selectin are going to cause the monocyte to roll on the surface of the endothelium. So the first phase is rolling. Now the endothelial cell, sorry, the monocyte will eventually come to a halt. So let's say it's come to a halt here now, okay? And when it comes to a halt, you will have a permanent, now, interaction between Cyanyl Lewis X and the E-selectin molecules on the surface of the endothelial cell. Okay, so here's the E-selectin again in red. Sorry, it's smudging so badly. And here is Cyanyl Lewis X in turquoise. Okay, and I'll put the nucleus of the monocyte back on again. Now... What's going to follow is you're going to get weak adhesion, and this is going to involve, again, interactions between cell adhesion molecules on the surface of the endothelial cell and cell adhesion molecules on the surface of the monocyte. Okay, but this time, 
Unlike the neutrophils, you've actually now got two interactions, two different interactions. So you're going to have ICAM1 molecules on the surface of this endothelial cell, and you're also going to have VCAM1, which I think I'll do in blue rather than turquoise, since we've coloured in Silar Lewis X in turquoise. Okay, so these, remember, are two immunoglobulin superfamily cell adhesion molecules. So here is the intercellular adhesion molecule 1. Okay, and this blue one represents the vascular cell adhesion molecule 1. And now they're both going to interact with integrin cell adhesion molecules on the surface of the monocyte. So ICAM1 will interact with its old favourite, uh, the LIFA1, the lymphocyte function associated antigen uh, 1. Okay, so I'll colour this in, in pink here. So in pink, that is LIFA1, okay, which is an integrin cell adhesion molecule. So this highlights a very important principle that immunoglobulin cell superfamily cell adhesion molecules don't just have to link with another immunoglobulin uh, superfamily cell adhesion molecule. They can link with other families of cell adhesion molecules, such as the integrins. And LIFA1 is specifically the alpha L beta 2 integrin. Okay, uh, now, what cell adhesion molecule does the VCAM1 bind to? Well, this is a new guy. Okay, so the int it's again an integrin cell adhesion molecule, but this time it's what's known as VLA4, okay, which stands for Very Late Antigen 4. Okay, so very late antigen 4, or VLA4, is shown here in orange. So let me highlight that up, bring this up a little bit. Okay, and again, it's an integrin uh, cell adhesion molecule. So it has an alpha chain and it has a beta chain, or rather an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. Okay, now the alpha subunit in the case of VLA4 is alpha 4 and the beta subunit is beta 1. So VLA4 is the alpha 4 beta 1 integrin. Now, initially, these interactions between these two immunoglobulin superfamily cell adhesion molecules, ICAM1 and VCAM1, and their corresponding integrin uh, cell adhesion molecules is very weak. Okay, So this forms a weak adhesion between uh, the activated endothelial cell uh, and, and I'm trying to write endothelial now, uh, weak adhesion, and the monocyte. Okay, so the way to activate these integrins this time, because that's the way to make these interactions stronger, you need to activate the integrins, it's going to involve this CCL2 this time that we're now going to have on our surface. So again, on the glycocalyx, specifically attached to the heparan sulfate proteoglycan, you have this chemokine, which is CCL2. So let's put this here, and we'll colour it in in vivid purple again. Okay, so this is the CC chemokine ligand 2. Okay, so this is CCL2. And it will bind to a receptor on the surface of the monocyte here. So let's draw that happening. Uh, so we'll draw uh, the receptor for CCL2 in yellow here. Okay, now this receptor for CCL2 is what's known as CCR2, which stands for the CC chemokine receptor 2. Okay, so this is the CC chemokine receptor 2. So remember, the CC uh, is a family of chemokines, one of the main families of chemokines. So CC chemokine receptor 2. Okay, now when CC chemokine ligand 2 binds to the CC chemokine receptor 2 on the surface of the monocyte, that is going to cause activation of both the LIFA1, the lymphocyte function associated antigen 1, and also VLA4, the very late antigen 4. So both of these integrins are going to be activated, and that will mean now uh, that their interactions with these uh, immunoglobulin superfamily cell adhesion molecules suddenly become much tighter. So you're now going to get tight adhesion between the uh, endothelial cell and the monocyte. Okay, now what will then follow is diapodesis of the monocyte across the endothelium. And this is the same as always, 
um, the monocyte will deform to squish through the gap between the two endothelial cells and as it moves through uh, PCAM1 uh, cell adhesion molecules on the surface of the monocyte will interact with PCAM1 molecules that are on uh, the surface of the endothelial cell that lines the gap, basically. And that will assist the monocyte in coming across the endothelium into the interstitial space. And then once it's in the interstitial space, it will differentiate into a macrophage, and these macrophages will then go and phagocytose uh, the invading pathogen and digest them, and that's how we're going to uh, clear the infection. Well, it's one of the ways we're going to clear the infection. Now, this completes the acute inflammatory response, okay? Uh, it does not complete immunology. There is the entire adaptive immune system that comes in much later, basically. This will occur, you know, within a few um, hours at the maximum, okay? Um, well, uh, within 24 hours, certainly, all of this that we've described now would have occurred. Of course, some bits occur within minutes, which we've described as we've gone through. Uh, but within days, what will happen is the adaptive immune response will kick in, and that's very, very powerful as well. Um, but we'll discuss the adaptive immune response in a separate video. Okay, so what we're now going to turn our attention to is ways of stopping this acute inflammatory response from occurring. And you might ask, well, why on earth would we want to stop the acute inflammatory response? It's there to deal with a pathogen, isn't it? Well, occasionally, uh, the acute inflammatory response can be highly dangerous, okay? So, sometimes it can be activated against self, basically. It can be activated when there is no pathogen, and the acute inflammatory response really should not be activated, okay? Also, sometimes it can be acting against a pathogen, but the damage it causes to the body is more serious than the threat of the pathogen, basically. And in those situations as well, we would want to stop the acute inflammatory response. Okay, so this is the power of anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so we will uh, begin our discussion of anti-inflammatory drugs with the antihistamines in the next video.